Starting a new series of scripture talks called Invited, A New Way of Living, and it's based on the book of Colossians. And so over the summer months, we're going to do a chapter by chapter um, look, take a good look at the book of Colossians and the implications that it has for our lives. Uh, for those of us who've signed up to follow Jesus closely, there will be uh, an invitation for us to, um, to do life differently. And uh, that'll impact our relationships and uh, so many practical aspects of our lives. But the book of Colossians is a beautiful four-chapter book, um, again, that reminds us of the supremacy of the Lord Jesus. And uh, so we're going to start our deeper dive um, again today as it relates to the book of Colossians. But just before we do that, uh, I want to direct your attention at some point after this um, YouTube recording is over and uh, to take a look at the link in the description box below. Uh, as a church family, we've initiated a um, chapel project where we're reclaiming some space in our former auditorium. Uh, previous generations exchanged marriage vows, were baptized, dedicated their children, celebrated family and friends who had passed on into the presence of God. That space is now being used for storage, which was typically what we would call the altar space or the platform or the baptistry. And we're looking at building a chapel there that will seat about 150 people. And uh, so the description box below holds a link for you. You can learn more about how you can be a part of that and some more details about that project. Uh, but this series, again, four chapter book based on the book of Colossians. Um, we're, we're going to consider a passage to ponder during the summer months. And um, Colossians chapter 3, the first four verses are absolutely beautiful and they hold out so much clarity for us as it relates to the adventure of following Jesus. Um, Paul, again, who's the author of the book, writes these words. He says in uh, chapter 3, beginning in verse 1, Since then you have been raised with Christ. He says, Set your hearts on things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. So he says, make sure your heart is moving in all the right directions and it's moving towards Jesus. And, and the reason why it's moving in that direction is we have been raised up with Christ. There's this acknowledgement that in Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, we too have identified with his death, burial, and have been raised up as new people, new humans, so to speak. We are part of God's new creation. He says we ought to set our hearts on Christ. And then he also says, set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. And then he says this, for you died. And I love what Dallas Willard says about this verse. He says, you can put a period right there. This is a big part of um, progress in the Christian faith is, is learning what it means to die to ourselves. He says, for you died. Your former way of life is now buried with Jesus. There's a whole new adventure that's been raised up with him. He says, and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. And then he says, when Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. It is a beautiful, beautiful passage. When Christ, who is your life, uh, this is the orientation of the believer, is that they have uh, put Jesus at the very center, and they have said that my life is about Christ. To live is Christ, Paul would write to the Philippians, to die is gain. How could he say that unless Jesus was literally his life? To live is Christ, to die is gain. To die is not the end of the story. It's to actually be fully united with the one we love. And so this side of heaven, we're learning what it means to cultivate that kind of love for God. So the book of Colossians, I hope you'll join us every week during the summer months in person. You're always invited. And if you're unable to make it in person because you're traveling or you've got vacation time that's taking you to faraway places, whatever that looks like, or you're just feeling uncomfortable to be with us in person, please, I want to encourage you to join with us every week on this YouTube channel. So just a bird's eye, 30,000 foot view of the book of Colossians. Uh, the Apostle Paul is the author of the book. He's writing from um, prison in the middle of the first century to a group of people who needed clarity around Jesus' supremacy and how to live under the leadership of King Jesus. That's, that's the authorship of Paul. That's the occasion he's writing because they need clarity about Jesus and his supremacy. Um, so the book of Colossians includes uh, doctrinal teaching. So it helps provide instruction. Um, Paul would write 
later, um, he would say these words, watch your life and doctrine closely, because if you do so, you'll save both yourself and your hearers. In other words, it really matters what we believe. And it is not new in this, uh, in this time in history when there are, is a smorgasbord of, of menu options, so to speak, of what to believe. And so it really does matter that we have orthodox beliefs about the Lord Jesus and about the ways of God. And so these first Christians needed some clarity around um, doctrine, what is true and what should be believed and what should be taught. And again, some practical advice for Christian living. They needed to be reminded about the supremacy of Jesus as king, um, that he is over and above all kings. Again, scripture would teach that he is the king of kings. Even the kings in this world report to Jesus. They may not acknowledge that, but they do because he is the sovereign God of heaven and earth. And so the supremacy of Jesus as king was important. And then also Jesus is not an add-on to another worldview. So we don't just add Jesus to an already reasonably full life and say, there, I've looked after the afterlife piece, or I've looked after the guilt piece, or whatever that might be. Uh, we don't add Jesus to a um, already rather full menu of beliefs. Jesus becomes our lens by which we see the world. Uh, we look at our relationships, our work, our health, the way we just engage the world. We look at that through the lens of Jesus, Jesus as the crucified, resurrected King. And uh, I, I like what Tim Mackey says, if you're not familiar with the Bible Project, there's some awesome resources there. You can just go to thebibleproject.org and you'll find awesome videos there about themes in the Bible, whole books of the Bible. But he says this um, about the book of Colossians. He says, we're invited to live in the present as if the new creation arrived when Jesus rose from the dead. Um, this is why we've called this series Invited, A New Way of Living. Uh, because we are invited um, to live in these present moments, in the here and now, as if the new creation arrived when Jesus rose from the dead. So this idea of the old humanity and the new humanity, um, again, Paul writes about the old humanity, which is distorted sexuality and destructive speech. He says that just has no place in the Christian faith. And then instead, he says the new humanity is all about generosity and forgiveness and love. It's just these are themes that emerge throughout the book of Colossians. And then Paul doesn't leave us just in the realm of doctrine or the supremacy of Jesus, but he says the supremacy of Jesus has an implication on our parenting, on our marriage relationships, on our employee and employer relationships. All of things, all of these things really matter because Jesus transforms the structure of all of these relationships. So our text this morning is taken from just six verses in the first chapter of Colossians. And again, it's regarded as one of Paul's prison epistles, which means he's writing from, um, from a prison. He's incarcerated for announcing that Jesus is king. Uh, sometimes there can be costs associated with our belief and orientation around the fact that Jesus is king. So um, our teaching this morning is that we are invited to be people of faith, hope, and love. And uh, this shows up very clearly in the first six verses of chapter one. So let me read this for us. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus. There he is. The author declares himself. And he says, I'm an apostle. I'm like a missionary. I'm like a church planter. I'm a sent one. Jesus has sent me into the world to announce the kingdom of God. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God. This was God's choosing. And Timothy, our brother. So Timothy joins him on this adventure of, of communicating with the, the Colossian Christians. Um, and Timothy, our brother, to God's holy people in Colossae. That's why it's called Colossians. The faithful brothers and sisters in Christ. I love that. That greeting is like he's already saying, you're holy and you're faithful. This is who you are. And Paul was declaring that over the people of God. Holiness means that we are separate and set apart. Uh, we haven't been removed from the world, but we're rather distinct from the world. We live differently by the way we love, by the way we speak, by the way we express our sexuality, uh, by the way we keep our promises and the way we parent and approach marriage and all of these things. He says, you're the holy people of God and you're also faithful. You're in a faithful relationship with God through Christ. 
Then he continues and says, Grace and peace to you from God our Father. We always thank God the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ when we pray for you. Paul and Timothy were praying for the Christians in Colossae. And they're praying for them, he says, because we have heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love you have for all of God's people, the faith and love that spring from the hope stored up for you in heaven and about which you have already heard in the true message of the gospel that has come to you. The word of the Lord for us today. So three quick thoughts for us as it relates to faith, hope, and love. We are invited to put our faith in Christ Jesus. Now, faith can be a very um, uh, challenging conversation for people because the word can be a little bit ambiguous for people. It can be associated with belief and some, someone can say, I have faith because I believe in God. And there's an element of truth to that. And then other people say, I feel like I'm a, a spiritual person, so I have faith. And, and spirituality is a very diverse conversation in our culture. Um, but faith is more than belief, though it includes it, and it's more than being spiritual, though it includes it. Uh, Paul says, because we have heard of your faith in Christ Jesus, is what he says. So let's just talk a little bit about what faith is not and what faith is. So faith is not um, an emotion. Uh, though it may impact our emotions, uh, it's not limited to our emotions. In other words, faith and feelings are not equated. Sometimes you may not feel like you're full of faith, but you've chosen to believe. You've chosen to align yourself with the Lord Jesus, even though you might be lacking a measure of feeling or the emotions have not caught up yet to your advanced decision to believe and to trust. So faith is not limited to an emotion, though it may impact our emotions. Um, also, faith is not a feeling, as we just talked about. Feelings ebb and flow, but faith is objective. So when people say, I've lost my faith, um, it's not something that's just, I have it in a moment and it's gone the next. Uh, faith is rooted um, in this advanced decision, like we just mentioned, to give our loyalty and our allegiance to Jesus. And so losing it is not like I just have lost this capacity to feel a strong, compelling emotion. Emotions come and go. They ebb and flow. Faith is not like that. Uh, faith does include a measure of trust, and we'll get to that in just a second. Um, but, but here's what Paul wrote earlier to the Corinthians in chapter 15, the first four verses. He says, Now, brothers and sisters, I want to remind you of the gospel. I preach to you, which you received and on which you have taken your stand. Do you hear that? I've taken my stand on what I believe to be true about the gospel. He says, by this gospel, you are saved if you hold firmly to the word I preach to you. Otherwise, you have believed in vain. For what I received, I passed on to you as a first importance. Here comes the gospel, ready? That Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures, that he was buried that he was raised on the third day, according to the scriptures. This is the content of our faith. We believe this to be true, that Jesus was the unique, one-of-a-kind son of God. He died for the sins of the whole world. He was buried and he rose again. Again, this new human, so to speak, uh, showing us what the new humanity can look like. This is the gospel, to believe that to be true. So there is an objective element to our faith. It's not subjective only, though there is a measure of us choosing. It's a choice to believe the historic claims of the gospel of Jesus. And so that is something that my emotions may not feel um, strongly connected to in a given moment. But it doesn't mean I have not chosen faith. Emotions are like the tail. And... Um, our, our, our will is sort of like the brain of the dog. The, 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 the brain wags the tail. The tail doesn't wag the dog. We cannot live by our emotions. If we live by our emotions, we will make terrible decisions. And so faith is not limited to how we feel. And, and lastly, it is not certainty, though it does produce confidence. Uh, there is room for doubt, actually, as it relates to people of faith. Um, we, can, we can believe and we can struggle to believe, right? The father in Mark's gospel, chapter 9, verse 24 says, I do believe, I do have faith. But he says, help me overcome my unbelief. So these are the things that faith is not. It's not limited to emotions. It is not a feeling only. It is not about certainty. 
but it does produce confidence. All right, so what is faith then? Faith is this. Faith is a close companion of deeds and righteousness. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, it has a lot to do with allegiance and loyalty, an advanced decision to be fully committed or devoted. Um, here's James. He says in chapter 2, verse 18, but someone will say, you have faith. I have deeds. He says, show me your faith without deeds, and I will show you my faith by my deeds. In other words, faith and deeds walk together. They are one and the same in the sense that if I have saving faith in Jesus, if I've given him my allegiance, my deeds will reflect it, the way I choose to live in this world. And then in Romans 3, verse 22, this righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. And so being right before God is closely associated with our allegiance or our saving faith in Christ. And so um, it's a close companion of both deeds and righteousness. And then it is not opposed to science, but has referenced and has been referenced as the sixth sense. So the five senses, the things that we can measure, um, you know, science and faith are not on a collision course. Um, in fact, science, the world of science, often reveals the, um, the claims of the faith. And, uh, but the Bible is not a science textbook. Um, the Bible is a self-revelation of who God is and, and how we are to relate to him in the world and what his ways are, what they look like, and how we're invited into that. It's not a science textbook. Um, but science um, reveals the what, and scripture helps us with the why but they are not on a collision course at all. So it's not either or, it can be both and. Um, Hebrews chapter 11, first three verses, faith shows the reality of what we hope for. It is the evidence of things we cannot see. It's the sixth sense. Through their faith, the people in days of old earned a good reputation. By faith, we understand that the whole universe, well, science helps us with that, but the whole universe was formed by God's command. Again, science can't help us uh, find God, but they can show us how awesome he is. As we look under a microscope or look through a telescope, we see the beauty and the brilliance of God's handiwork. Um, that, we, that what we now see did not come from anything that can be seen. So God himself, who is spirit, has made that which we can see. And so uh, it's not opposed to science, and it has been referenced as a sixth sense. And in Hebrew, uh, the word emuna, the word for faith is, is, is in Hebrew, emuna. It can be translated support. And so some people say, you know, I don't need a crutch in this world. Uh, faith is a crutch. Well, I, what, they, what they're really trying to say is you, you cannot live uh, independently without this idea of a God. Well, actually pregnant within the, the, the concept of faith is this idea that God does support his people. In fact, even the people who say, I don't need a crutch, um, they need their next breath. We need our next breath from God. And so we are not independent creatures. We are dependent creatures on um, God who is spirit to support our very life. And so literally we put our faith in him. We give him our allegiance. We put the full weight of our lives on him and he can support us. All right, so faith. Second one is, is uh, love. We are invited to love God's people. Jesus taught us that the world would know that we're his disciples by our love for one another. These people love differently. That's what our world should see in the Christian community. Um, and again, back to, back to Paul here in Colossians. Because we have heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love that you have for all of God's people. We are to love each other with God's kind of love. It's actually literally that word, that verse is agape. It's God's unconditional love. We are supposed to love God's people the way God loves us. It doesn't matter across generations, racial divides, gender, economic, political divides, whatever those are, we look past them all and see that somebody is an image bearer of God, someone for whom Christ died, and we love them the way God loves us. So I have a question for you, and it's a bit of a loaded one. Does love have standards? Does love have standards? Um, scripture teaches that God is love. So let's kind of explore that question for just a moment. Does love have, sta have standards? Um, and does God have standards? Um, God's love for us is 
unconditional, which means that you don't qualify for it, you don't earn it. So in its purest sense, love does not have standards. And as we extrapolate what love is, love is always holding out what's best for the beloved. And so um, because God always holds out what's best for us, he will relate with us in a way that will always deliver what's best for us. And in the moment, it may not feel best, but because God loves us, he gives us what we need. He redeems the circumstances of our lives. And so um, we can approach our life a little differently when we understand I don't have to earn and work or qualify for God's love. I am just loved. And at the same time, the standard is that what's best for the beloved informs the expression of that love. And so you've heard before, tough and tender love. Any parent that's raised a child knows that there's a time for the tender and there's a time for a little tougher. And we do it because it's best for the beloved. And so um, God invites us to love one another the way he loves us, unconditionally. And yet when we do it, there will be a measure of tenderness about it and there'll be a measure of toughness about it. And uh, we need to be careful that uh, we're not too tough. We all have our limits. We all have a breaking point. And it's always got to be what's best for the beloved. And, um, and so we, we need to be careful that we uh, understand that if we're going to be Jesus following people, those of us who've signed up to follow him, put our saving faith in him, we need to love the way God loves. And, um, and so love does have standards and yet it's unconditional. We can sit with that for a little while. All right, number three, here's the last thought for today. We're invited to be people of future hope. Um, hope is about confident expectation. It's about what's coming next. Um, we lean into the future knowing that there's a good God waiting for us there. Um, the hope of the Christian community is that life and history is moving somewhere. It's led by a benevolent and kind and generous and good God. And what he's doing, we can trust him with. Um, the actions he is undertaking are always good. And so both on the macro and the micro aspects of life, we're living through a time in history for many of us. It's um, uh, the end of a hundred year pandemic, so to speak. Not that it's lasted for a hundred years, but they come about every hundred years. And it feels like it's lasted that long, but here we are moving towards the back end of it. And these are unusual times in history. When we look at the macro, we say God is up to something. Uh, God is always working, orchestrating the events of history. And on a macro level and on a micro level, we can actually make friends with the idea that there is someone who is co-authoring this story of my life with me. And he is moving the characters around and he is introducing me to ideas and experiences and thoughts and, and all sorts of relationships and things that move around me that I don't have a lot of control over. Sometimes I wish it was different. There is a God who is co-authoring this story with me. Our job is to say to the co-author, what do you want to do with the next chapter? And, and, and consult him so that we can write a good and beautiful story with him. So finally, just before we wrap up, the book of Colossians is about a new humanity. We're invited into a new way of living. And when we look at Jesus, we learn what the new humanity is supposed to look like. And Jesus has risen from the dead, um, a down payment or a, a fast forward, so to speak, of what we ought to be, new creatures in Jesus. Thanks be to God that the old person's been dead and buried, sins have been forgiven, crucified with Christ, raised up to new life, powerful Holy Spirit within us so that we can overcome, not perfectly, but so that we can grow and hopefully progressively resemble Jesus more and more with each passing day. And then we are the new creation ourselves. Again, remember Paul, the old has passed away, the new has come, and it's not just us. God is making all things new. The rabbis used to say this, that when we um, live our lives without God awareness, it's like living our lives in a vestibule. You know, a vestibule is that space between the outside and the rest of the room. Or think about a big box store. You walk into Walmart and there's the sliding doors that open up and then another set of sliding doors that open up. It's sort of to keep the temperature. When we live our lives without a God awareness, we're living in that small tight compartment when the rest of the room is opened up to us. And so we want to be people of faith who understand there is a big wide open room that we want to step into. And then finally, God is working. Uh, this is the truth. You know, we read in the creation account, God worked for six days and then he rested. 
And it's a rhythm for us. We work and we rest. We work and we rest. It's the rhythm of life, the way it's intended to be. Man is not a machine. We are humans. And at the same time, Jesus taught us that his father was always working, that he was always doing something and also inviting us into his rest. And so that we can stop having to prove ourselves or earn our way uh, with him or to tilt the scales of our moral goodness. We can just rest in what Jesus has done for us. And then because we have a great realization of that, we can step into a beautiful life with him. We can partner with him in the world. The rabbis used to say this, that once you have had a God awakening or a God awareness in your life, and as Christians, we would say, when you've come to saving faith in Jesus, now you are enlisted by God to be a repairer of the world. Our world around us is broken. We, to some degree, are broken. Even those of us who put our saving faith in Jesus. God is rebuilding the world and he's enlisting partners. And so, the rest of our lives, we become co-laborers, so to speak, with God. Repairing the world one conversation at a time, one day at a time, one choice at a time choosing the good and beautiful life. I love what Mother Teresa said. If we all would just sweep the outside of our door, the whole world would be clean. And so I want to invite you into that beautiful, beautiful process of, um, first of all, allowing Jesus to make you clean and then joining him in his fantastic work of repairing the world. So I want to pray for you and I'm going to send it back to our host pastors. Father, thank you for this opportunity for us to do a little deeper dive into the book of Colossians. Thank you for the call or the invitation um, to be people who explore a new way of living. Uh, also pray today, God, that you would help us to be people who are... Not